I think it goes without saying that no one likes a hypocrite. No one likes a hypocrite. In fact, one of the number one reasons that is listed for people leaving the church is hypocrisy. People looking at individuals within the church saying one thing about the things that they believe about Christ and yet doing another. Their life doesn't match at all the things that they profess to believe uh, according to the Bible, according to the gospel, according to Jesus. No one likes hypocrisy. Now, in, in some sense, we need to define hypocrisy, though it's a perhaps a common thing for us, there is actually a hypocrisy in the Bible that might be slightly different than what we would usually define it as. So we typically think of hypocrisy as what I just said. We say one thing and do another. Our actions don't align with our words. And that certainly is a form of hypocrisy. But hypocrisy is more than that. It's more than just saying one thing and doing another. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus uses the word hypocrisy again and again and again, specifically to kind of point out the lives of the Pharisees. And that's what we're going to end with on Sunday morning in Matthew 23. He keeps calling them hypocrites. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites, again and again and again. In fact, seven times he calls them hypocrites. hypocrites. So what does Jesus mean when he says hypocrisy. Well, it really means uh, that hypocrisy, as Jesus defines it, is someone whose internal life does not match their external life. So in that sense, you can say and do the same thing and still be, according to Jesus, a hypocrite. You can say one thing and your external actions can align with that thing, and yet Jesus would say you can still be a hypocrite. And why is that? Because hypocrisy, as Jesus defines it, is someone whose internal life, their heart, does not match their external life. In fact, that's what Jesus says in Matthew 23. The Pharisees, they're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they look like and perhaps they say things that align. But internally, it's, it's nothing but rotting and decay. It's like dead bones underneath the surface. That's hypocrisy according to Jesus. And even in Matthew 5, I believe it's Matthew 5, 48, that Jesus says, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, how does that connect to hypocrisy? Well, the Greek word for perfect really means to, to con- communicate a sense of wholeness or completeness. Jesus says, you must be whole. You must be complete like your heavenly father is complete. And what he means by that is that your external life matches your internal life. That's what it means to be a whole person. That you're not divided in your attention. You're not divided in your pursuits, your affections, your appetites. They're not divided. They're singular in their focus. We must be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. Now hypocrisy as we've already said, is something that is a stumbling block for many people. But even as, last, as we, saw, we talked about last night, the pursuit of happiness that we are all after, which is really what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the main stumbling blocks for you as high school students to that happiness, as Jesus defines it, is hypocrisy, is doing one thing externally Perhaps for you, it looks like going to winter weekend retreats, attending every Sunday night, the best night of your lives, plants and pillars, right? Reading the Bible daily. Perhaps your external actions match the things that you say, but internally, there's nothing but decay. You're like a whitewashed tomb. And Jesus says that is hypocrisy. That's not being a whole person that is experiencing the vibrancy in life that Jesus is inviting you into. And so this morning, I want us to consider together how we can overcome that sense of hypocrisy and the things that we should value and prioritize as a means for us to truly experience life, vibrancy, and flourishing as Jesus defines it. So if you've got your Bibles, go again to Matthew chapter 
5. I want to start by just doing some review of last night so that we can continue kind of laying this foundation of answering the question, how can we have happiness? Remember, we used that illustration last night of a door. At the, at the top of the door, it says, enter here for true happiness. But in order to enter, you have to forget, reject every definition of happiness that you have ever come to understand. And you have to accept and receive the definition that Jesus is giving us in the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5, let's look again at verses 1 and 2. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying. Now last night we made that connection of mountains in the Bible were seen as places of divine revelation. You think of Moses going up on Mount Sinai, receiving revelation from God, and then proclaiming it to the nation of Israel. Jesus, he goes up on this mountain, takes the seat as a rabbi, as a teacher, uh, and begins to proclaim revelation from God. Here's what you need to know. And what is he proclaiming? What is he inviting people to understand and to experience? Well, one of the things that we said is that as a prophet, as someone who is proclaiming things from God, Jesus is offering and inviting his hearers into the way of being in the world that will result in their true and full flourishing now and in the age to come. And that's what we're after. That's what we want to know. How can we grab onto true flourishing, true happiness? And the Beatitudes, these first verses of the the Sermon on the Mount, are Jesus' answer to the human question about happiness. An answer given in the form of a series of promises and challenges. And really it all kind of is summarized by Jesus in Matthew 7 when he says there's two ways. There's two paths. One leads to life flourishing happiness. The other leads to death, destruction, deception. He says there's two paths. There's a wide road. There's a narrow road. There's two trees. There's a thorn bush. There's a fruit tree. There's two foundations. There are those who build on the rock and those who build on the sand. And the question for you this morning is which path are you on? Jesus is showing you the path that leads to blessing, that leads to happiness. And last night we covered the first three Beatitudes, poor in spirit, those who mourn, and those who are meek. And in an upside down way, and in a way that grates against our natural hearts, Jesus says, in order to be happy, you must be poor in spirit. You must accept that you have nothing, that you are nothing, spiritually speaking. You bring nothing to God. And when compared to God, you are utterly undone, as Isaiah says in Isaiah 6. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who realize they have nothing, they are nothing. Blessed are those who mourn who grieve over their sin, who recognize that their sin against God and God only have they sinned, as Jesus says, and they're broken over that sin. And blessed are those who are meek, those who are humble, those who are gentle, those who are not out to get theirs, even if from an earthly perspective, they truly are due. And why is that? Because we understand, if you are a follower of Christ, that a payday is coming. And it's going to be big. Jesus says they will inherit the the earth, the land. Their inheritance is coming and it's far greater, far richer than anything this world has to offer. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, and those who are meek. I want us to look at the next three Beatitudes this morning as we continue to ask the question, what does it mean to have Happiness. What is this path that Jesus is showing us and directing us to that leads to true and lasting flourishing? Look at it with me, Matthew 5, beginning in verse 6. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now again in verse 6, we have a somewhat surprising statement by Jesus. The type of people that truly are happy. And it comes in the form of another negative statement. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. 
there's a sense of lack. There's a sense of need. There's a sense of having or desiring something that you don't have. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what does this mean, right? What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Righteousness. Well, as we just said, right, it's carrying on the theme of lack. It's carrying on uh, the theme of not having perhaps the thing that you desperately need. It's living in a, in a constant state of tension. And so righteousness, in that sense, is to be declared righteous by God uh, by doing right by God and also doing right by others. So the word righteousness means to live rightly. And there's two primary ways that we do that. We live rightly. We do right by God, first and foremost, and then we do right by others. Secondly, we see this as an example in Genesis 15, 6, when Abraham, he believes God. He has faith in God. It says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is Abraham relating with God in the correct way, trusting being confident in the promises of God, the character of God. He's relating rightly to God, and it's counted to him as righteousness. That's one way that we can think of it. But there's also a, a sort of horizontal way that we can think of it, where we relate rightly with others. This is seen in, for example, Jeremiah 22, verse 3. It says, Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor. This is other individuals, right, other humans, other image bearers, deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. So we have two ways of defining righteousness. It's relating rightly with God and it's relating rightly with others. That's what it says, do justice and righteousness. And how do we do that? by delivering them from the hand of the oppressor, by doing no wrong, doing no violence, treating others with the type of treatment that God would expect of us, relating rightly with others. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to hunger for right relationship with God and right relationship with others. Now I hope in some sense, if you're kind of thinking through this, you're thinking this sounds like something very familiar in the New Testament. It, it sounds like the great commandment, right? Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, the Pharisees, they come up to Jesus and they say, what is the greatest of the law? What's the greatest commandment? And here's his response. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness, in essence, is to live, to, to walk in, to pursue fulfilling the great commandment. To love God and love your neighbor rightly. That's what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. To relate rightly with God. And as a result of that, to relate rightly with others. Now, we understand that we live in a world where that is simply not the case, where we often don't relate well with others. We often don't relate rightly with God. And yet our response as people who are seeking to follow the path that Jesus is laying out and inviting us to, to experience life and flourishing, is to do what God has commanded us to do in hungering and thirsting for righteousness. There's a sense of craving. There's a sense of craving restoration for the things that have been broken relationally between God and between our fellow man. And that's point number one for you this morning. Crave full restoration of relationships. If you want to, A, not be a hypocrite, and B, experience the, the true good life that Jesus is inviting you to, crave full restoration of relationships. That's what Jesus says. And again, it seems weird. He's saying, blessed are those who crave restoration for a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. How does this lead to happiness? Well, we'll unpack that more in a second, but we need to crave this. We need to desire this, hunger and thirst for this. Crave full restoration of relationships. In essence, Jesus is saying, blessed are those who constantly crave a right relationship with God 
in a right relationship with others. And from a health perspective, right? We live in Idaho and doctors, you know, we don't like them here, I guess. Um, But from a health perspective, right? Craving something can often be a sign in your body that something's off. It can mean that you're dehydrated. It can mean that you're uh, dealing with stress. It can mean that you're lacking in sleep, which perhaps is most of us this morning, right? From a health perspective, when you crave something, oftentimes it means there's something wrong. There's something that your body needs in order to kind of return to a, a normal place of health, homeostasis, if you will, right? From a spiritual perspective, your cravings can also indicate that something is off. The way that we relate with God and others is not the way that it should be. We doubt God when we should trust God. We exchange the the truth of God for a lie. That's what Paul says in Romans 1. We, We settle for temporary pleasure when God offers us eternal joy. We often do not relate rightly with God. Our cravings are a sign that there are perhaps things, spiritually speaking, going wrong in our hearts. And that's just relating with God. We don't need any time proving that we often don't relate rightly with others, right? We betray other people's trust. Uh, We mistreat others. We use unkind words. Uh, We are thoughtless. We are selfish. Things are not what they should be. And someone who is blessed who is happy, hungers and thirst for restoration in their relationships, first and foremost with God, and as a result in an overflow of that with one another. We crave that. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. The person who is blessed recognizes that things are not what they should be and craves for them to be restored, for God to restore what was broken. And ultimately, the person who is blessed longs to have a right and deep relationship with God that leads to a right and deep relationship with others. Our soul should hunger for this, hunger and thirst for righteousness, for God to restore relationships that once were in the garden between Adam, Eve, and and the Lord. There was no division. They related rightly, perfectly with one another. And to be blessed, to be happy, is to crave restoration of that, to crave a right and deep relationship, first and foremost, with God. David says in Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My question for you this morning, and I mean this seriously, what do you hunger and thirst for? What do you hunger and thirst for? What do you desire and crave? What do your appetites lead you to? Is it for people's approval of you, for acceptance, for recognition, for accomplishments? What do you hunger? What do you crave for? What do you long for? Because Jesus says those who long for right relationships— First with God, second with others, they will be blessed. And I want you to ask yourself this, truly ask yourself this this morning. Are the things that you crave, the things that you hunger and thirst for that are outside of God, can they bring you true and lasting happiness? Do your cravings lead to happiness? Or do they lead to discontentment, a lack of fulfillment, a lack of joy, a lack of happiness? Can your cravings lead you to life and flourishing? Or even to ask it in a similar way that Jesus does, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? You need to wrestle with that this weekend. What do you crave 
and the things that you crave, can they lead to life and happiness? Or will they lead you to being a hypocrite, a whitewashed tomb that might look externally like he's got it all together, but internally there's nothing but dry and dead bones inside? Can the things you crave bring you true happiness? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they are happy. And what will they receive? What what is promised of these individuals? Well, if we look at verse 6, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It's like when you're I don't know, out on a hike and you're slightly dehydrated and you, you open your Nalgene, which I guess Nalgene's aren't as big as they used to be, uh, but you open your Nalgene you take a swig of water and you're, it's like, ah, it's exactly what I needed. It's satisfying. It's, it's refreshing. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Their thirst shall be quenched. Now, when I was 12 years old, I think I've talked about this before. I suddenly developed an intense, unquenchable thirst. And if that has ever happened to you, I don't know why it would have, but maybe. If that's ever happened to you, it is horrible. It's the worst of the worst. I mean, genuinely. I used to have these cups that I would place throughout the house because I would constantly need to get water. Again and again and again. I'd wake up at 3 in the morning, almost on the dot, every night. My mouth would be cotton. I would feel dehydrated. I'd go downstairs to the fridge, grab my cup, drink three glasses of water, go back to bed. And it just happened again and again and again. Each glass of water that I drank, it only satisfied me for a short time. And then the, 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 the intense craving, the unquenchable thirst, it came back in, in unnormal ways. Like this was not healthy. This was not uh, good. Every single night, right, I would wake up thirsty, dehydrated, dry mouth. I would need water again and again and again. And it turns out uh, that I was type 1 diabetic. And my, I guess I still am, but I was finding that out uh, when I was 12 Right? I was finding out that I was type 1 diabetic and my body wasn't processing the water correctly. Legitimately, it was going in one end and out the other, if you know what I mean. Right? It just wasn't sticking in my body. Uh, it was as if I wasn't even drinking it, truly. It, my body was in a constant state of dehydration no matter how much water I drank. When it comes to drinking from the fountain of this world, you're going to find out very quickly that your thirst is never going to be quenched. You're going to have to keep returning again and again and again. And it might feel like to the the touch of your tongue, it might feel like you're quenching your thirst, but you'll find out quickly it won't last. You're going to have to keep going again and again. You'll never be satisfied. It will never last. But Jesus says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness— for a right relationship with God and others, what do they get? They will be satisfied. Their thirst will be quenched. It is exactly what their soul needs. In Jesus in John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's exactly what they need, and it will bring, Jesus will bring, true and lasting satisfaction. What do you crave? As high school students, what do you desire? What do you hunger and thirst after? And ask yourself, will it quench your thirst? If you've been in this world for any amount of time, you have to acknowledge that drinking from the fountain of this world never leaves you satisfied. You have to keep coming back for more. And it's like your body's just rejecting it. It's going in one end and right out the other. It's not even sticking or, or lasting. But Jesus says, whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's a type of person that experiences true and lasting happiness and flourishing. Now here's another one in verse 7. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Now what does it mean to be merciful? All right, these are the questions that we're asking. Well, in a sense, it means uh, to have favor, 
to show grace or kindness or, or love. I think a practical way of thinking about it is forgiving someone who has wronged you or owed you. That's, in a sense, what it means to apply mercy. Forgiving someone who has wronged you or someone that owes you. Blessed are those who are willing to show kindness and love to another, even if they haven't been shown kindness and love themselves. That is the person that is blessed. If you keep reading in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to say, love your who? Neighbor. Your neighbor, your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you, those that hate you, right? Love them, right? Blessed are those who show kindness and love to one another, even if they haven't been shown kindness and love themselves. An example of this in, in Luke 18, 13 it says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, show me mercy. Show me favor. Show me kindness. Forgive me of my sin, of my wrongdoing. Show me mercy. And David in Psalm 51, 1, perhaps one of the most famous Psalms of David, he says, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. The person who is blessed, truly blessed, recognizes the mercy that they have received and willingly shows that mercy to others. Blessed are the merciful. And really we're talking about, in a sense, forgiveness. That's mercy in action. Forgiveness of others who have wronged you, even if they don't deserve it. And that's point number two this morning. Forgive out of the forgiveness that you yourself have received. Forgive out of the forgiveness you have received. You know, the least happy people I know in this world, they refuse to forgive others. Jesus says the path to true happiness is marked with showing mercy, with showing forgiveness. And this makes sense, right? I mean, Christians, above all other people, should be known for our forgiveness. <laughs> Why is that? Because we ourselves have been forgiven. We have received Mercy, that's really embedded within the heart of the gospel is that God shows us mercy through Christ. Even though we don't deserve it, he forgives us. He shows us mercy. Be merciful to us, O God, a sinner. And he is through the gospel of Christ. So Christians, above everyone else in the world, we should be known by this, by our mercy. And yet so often, we're not. So often we choose to walk the path of unhappiness and not show mercy to our neighbor. I want you to understand this. Listen, make no mistake about this. Forgiveness is not only a happiness issue. It's a gospel issue. An unwillingness to forgive is a misunderstanding of the gospel. An unwillingness to forgive even the most heinous of wrongs committed against you is to misunderstand what you yourself have received in Christ Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, those who have received mercy from God and who are willing to dispense that mercy to others freely because they themselves received it freely. There's a story in, in Matthew 18 that really illustrates this well. Matthew 18, 32 through 35. This is the, the story where the guy that owes a great debt, he goes to the king, I believe, and, and says, hey, I, I don't got the money. I ain't got it. And, and the king's like, hey, no big deal. I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to forgive the debt. Though you owe me, though I'm entitled, I'm going to forgive your debt. Don't worry about it. Your debt is, has been cleared. And what's, what's the guy do? He turns around, goes to the corner where the guy owes him $5 and a lollipop, and he says, give it to me right now or I'm going to throw you in jail. And that's exactly what he does. And this is where we pick up in the story, Matthew 18, verse 32. It says, then, he, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. 
And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Forgiveness is a gospel issue. And on the other side of forgiveness is the path to true blessing. It feels upside down. We want to hold things against people. We want to kind of stew in our bitterness, in our anger, in our hurt. Jesus says the path to true and lasting life is on the other side of forgiveness. Showing mercy in the same way that you yourself have been shown it. Do you want to be happy? Jesus says forgive. Show mercy even when someone doesn't deserve it. And on the other side of forgiveness is happiness that Jesus is inviting you into this morning. Bitterness and unforgiveness will decay your heart and rob you of happiness quicker than you'll ever realize. And the thing for us this morning, we need to trust Jesus' invitation to have mercy and to trust that though it feels upside down, on the other side of that, there is blessing. There is happiness and life and flourishing. What do these people receive? Well, again, we're in verse 7. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, those who extend forgiveness, for they shall receive mercy. Your forgiveness of others, your showing mercy towards others, if you're a believer, is commanded by God. It's not just an ideal that Jesus is saying. It's also a command, a command that leads to blessing, to be sure, but a command nonetheless. And refusing to forgive not only damages your relationship with others, it damages your relationship with God. And all of a sudden, we're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We're not relating rightly with God and with others. If we're not willing to show mercy, we're damaging our relationship. We're not relating rightly with God and with others. In fact, here's some scary verses, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now this isn't Jesus saying that God's going to somehow remove his forgiveness offered to you in Christ and he's going to take your salvation. That's not what he's saying. But certainly... Your right relating with God, your relationship with God can be damaged, can be hindered by your lack of forgiveness. Refusing to forgive others is hypocritical. It's, I don't know of any better example of hypocrisy than refusing to extend forgiveness. If we've been forgiven such a great debt, our sin in the face of a holy God we of all people should be willing to forgive others. We should hunger and thirst for righteousness, relating rightly with God, relating rightly with others. What's it going to require? It's going to require mercy. Mercy that is an overflow of recognizing the mercy that you have received from God and that you then can give and distribute to others. Refusing to forgive is hypocritical. You can look externally, you can say externally all the right things, but internally your heart is misaligned. You're not a whole person as Jesus calls you to be. We of all people should be willing to forgive. And Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Their relationship with God will flourish. It'll lead to contentment and happiness and joy. Blessed are the merciful. And finally, verse 8. Here's the last one for this morning. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does it mean uh, to be pure in heart? Well, certainly the word pure, it has connotations of being clean, right? Blameless. But in, in a sense, it means a singleness of heart towards God. It's, it's a transparency and, and an uncompromising desire to please God. It's like your heart is singularly focused on rightly relating to God and by extension, others. That's what it means to be pure in heart, to be clean, to be blameless. 
So Jesus says, blessed are those who desire to be singularly devoted to God, both externally with our actions and internally with our hearts. There's this both and. Our actions should demonstrate righteousness. Our insides, our internal life, our hearts, our desires, our affections, our appetites, all of that should also be uh, devoted to God. Blessed are those who desire to be singularly devoted to God, both externally with your actions and internally with your heart. And that's number three for you this morning. Desire your internal life to match your external. Desire for the things inside of you that no one else in this room can see match before the Lord. That you are pure in heart, singular in your devotion to God, pure, blameless before God. The Lord. And this perhaps is one of the more difficult things for high school students to do. Right? It's easy, in a sense, to have an external appearance of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I mean, from our perspective, it's not easy before the Lord, but from our perspective, it's easy to, to look like you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I might never know that you truly are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It can, from the outside, look perfect. You can be a whitewashed tomb, nice and clean on the outside. You might say the right things, do the right things. But internally, what's going on there? That's what Jesus is concerned about. It's easy to have an external appearance of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's another thing entirely to truly have that desire internally. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that the path to happiness comes from being a whole person. Your outside life and your inside life, they are working together and they're on the same page. The things that you're saying, the things that you're doing are matching what's really going on in your heart. And someone who externally and internally desires to love God and love others is someone that is blessed, someone that is pure in heart. And listen, being here at this winter weekend, we're talking about the Bible, we're going to discuss it, we're, we're, going to, we're worshiping, we're praying, there's a worship night this evening. None of that makes you pure in heart. None of this does. You can externally take notes, you can flip through the scriptures as we talk about them. That's external, but what's going on internally? Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yes, externally living that out, but it's driven by the internal heart desire to please God. That singular focus and devotion. And what do they receive? Well, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. Think about it this way. If you want to enter into the kingdom, What's it going to require? I don't know if you guys go to the gym, like a, a, a gym, right? Uh, my gym has like a key fob, right? Beep, and then you can walk into the gym, right? There's no one there. Like the door's locked. There's a key fob to get in. A pure heart is the, the entrance requirement to get into the kingdom of heaven. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we could say there's no one in heaven right now or in the future that it wasn't or isn't pure in heart. That's what Jesus is saying. He's inviting us to experience the blessing of that both now and into eternity. This is a direct reference to to Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. This is kind of the question. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who's going to make it? Who's going to scan their key fob and, and the door's going to open, right? Who's, who shall stand in his holy place? It is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generations of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Blessed are those who are pure in heart because they will have a right relationship with God that will lead them into right relationships with others. And what's that going to require? An ongoing willingness 
to show mercy. And to expect on the other side of that is blessing. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who relate rightly with God and relate rightly with others in the way that we should. Crave that, hunger for that, and trust that this path, this way that Jesus is inviting us to leads to life. Jesus, again, stands at the door. And on the top of the door, there's a sign that says, through here, you will find life and happiness. Enter at your own risk. You're going to have to acknowledge and admit that you are nothing, that you have nothing. You're going to have to be broken over your sin. You're going to have to show mercy when it's difficult. You're going to have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. But all of these things, though they seem upside down, they lead to life that you will never experience on this earth. You're going to keep drinking from the fountain of this world and keep being thirsty. Jesus invites you this morning to come to him, believe in him, and experience full satisfaction. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for Jesus' words here in the Sermon on the Mount that he's inviting us to, really showing us the way that leads to true life and true happiness. So Father, I pray that these high school students, that they would take these words seriously. That this would not just be some retreat that they came to just to have fun, but they, that they would really wrestle with what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to crave restoration, because we live in a broken and fallen world. Father, I pray that we, above all people, would demonstrate mercy because we ourselves have been given mercy. And Father, I pray that we would be pure in heart, that our internal life would match our external life, that we would not just be good churchgoers, good Bible readers, but that we would be people that relate rightly with you, that trust in you, that find their satisfaction in you. And as a result of that, we are cleansed because of the washing of uh, your, the, the, the blood of your son. Father, we are cleansed by that. We're forgiven. We're freed. And we're put on this path that leads to true blessing. So Father, I pray for our small groups now uh, that they would be encouraging and sharpening and that you'd be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen.